Hi, everyone. Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with Leslie Rodriguez Kritzer, Tony nominee of Monty Python Spam a Lot. Congratulations, Leslie. This is your first ever nomination. Yes. Um, you know, you've you've been in this business for a while. What was your reaction when you finally heard your name called as a nominee? Uh, well, I was in bed drinking coffee, watching, um, and hopeful. I didn't expect it, but my reaction was I screamed. I screamed, yes. And so, um, it was super exciting. It was like, I just, I just screamed. I was just like, couldn't believe it that I actually heard my name and, or saw my name. I was actually very, I was grateful because, you know, they say the names one at a time and you're like, yeah. but they showed them all the same time. And that was, that was a really <laughs> I was like, okay, there I am. Okay. Seeing it up there makes it real. <laughs> yes. Seeing it in print and like my name in print makes it real. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, Spamalot is just so much fun in itself, but I think one of the really great joys of this production was watching your cast members' uh, faces as they clearly heard your ad lib lines yes. for the first time. What, you know, did you ask for permission to ad-lib or you just go for it and ask for forgiveness later? Um, actually, when we were developing the show out of town in DC, I just tried things in rehearsal. So in rehearsal is the place where you can just sort of let loose everybody within the confines of the script, but then add. Um, and Josh Rhodes, just thank God for him. He was like, yeah, go for it. And then I kept building, especially that Camelot section uh, bigger and bigger, not too big, but yeah, they gave me the freedom and to, to kind of do that and do my own thing. Um, but I always, I, I know when to get out, you know, I don't overstay my welcome, which is um, through years of experience knowing it's like, okay, you know, we got the show does have to move on because it stops the show. So yeah, they, they were so supportive. I'm very, very grateful that they were. Yeah, it it was uh, a fun new addition. What happens, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, like you don't get a reaction you expect from an audience and then what comes next? Um, if I don't, it, it, in that in that particular part of the show in Spamalot, I was able to, when I don't get a reaction, I can either make fun of it or make fun of myself. And then I get a reaction from that. And then I can move on with this particular character. So it was always pretty easy uh, when you're when you make fun of a situation, they laugh because they're like, OK, they, they're, you're acknowledging the reality. Um, but most times it's like you're making fun of yourself. So uh, it's pretty easy to recover. Um, one time I did a joke that an audience did not like. And I, <laughs> I did I, I went out on limb and I, I did a, a kind of like not racy, but it was like a controversial joke and um, they didn't like it. So I just moved on and even. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't even talk about it. Um, but yeah, so that's like one time where it, it yeah, we're just moving on. Yeah. It kind of makes sense in a way that, you know, the lady of the lake as the diva of the show is the one who gets to do that, you know, and gets yes. to kind of hold court. Um, it's an interesting, you know, the, the show is such a huge ensemble. And yet I feel like you're the person who's often on stage by yourself. Like the diva's yes. lament is one of the moments where there's only one person on stage. Uh, what is that dynamic like when you really have the whole number resting on your shoulders? I mean, it's uh, pretty amazing. It's terrifying. I always say, I was talking to a friend of mine, um, you know, it's like you have to hit that three-pointer, you know, to win the game. And it feels like I have to do that eight shows a week, especially not only grail, you know, find your grail in certain notes that I had to sing, but, um, yeah, anytime I'm out there alone because the show has to keep moving, the energy has to keep moving. And it feels amazing because at this point I know how to do it and I know how to do it really well. Um, and I call it sort of crowd surfing when you're when you're riding the audience and you're riding their vibe too and the laughter, but also like having to sing these high notes and then you're either singing them or you're not. So it's kind of like, you just gotta have this confidence. And I. I ha I have to say, Spam a lot really gave me that, gave me the confidence to go. Oh, I can hold a show. I can hold a show on my shoulders, no problem. And um, that was like a real gift for me too, because I I think it was one of the first times on Broadway that I've been able to do that and show what I really do. And I think another first for you on Broadway. This is the first uh, Broadway credit, at least, where you've done a revival. Um, yes. Broadway shows have all been new works. 
So did you feel like you had to kind of like respond or interact with the original production or like Sada Ramirez's performance or how does that how does that relationship work? That's a really good question because it is the first thing that comes to your mind when you start rehearsal. Um, what is, how, how do you calibrate your performance and bring who you are? You know, Hannah Wanningham won, you know, the Olivier for her performance in it in London. Sada won their Tony here. And I want, I watched that Tony acceptance speech, which was very exciting. And I saw her, their performance. Um, you just kind of come in and you go, what do I think is funny in this? What, what is, I call it the Kritzer sauce, you know, what's the Kritzer sauce that I'm going to put on this, uh, right. To make it flavor, flavorful in the way I want it to be for me. Um, so you really do stay away from original cast recordings or recordings of any kind bootlegs. Um, and then you just live in the room and create in the moment free of judgment. And I was able to surround, I, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a group of men and casting creative team that supported that didn't have any preconceived ideas except you know be a diva <laughs> you know big bold things themes but um yeah I think I think that's that's the best way to do it in any any role that has been originated by someone else yeah you know, trust trust yourself yeah uh, your um prof you, the word diva makes me think of diva's lament and you, I feel like you borrow from every you know vocally borrow from every great diva there is uh in that mm -hmm. song how what was the process like of choosing you know those vocal stylings of different people and was that set every night or was there room to to play around with it um well so when when i did that it's it was actually in i know there it's easy to confuse because i'm a diva the entire time but it's so during find your grail i had that section in the beginning i think that's what you're referring to right um where i do all the you know i do all that <laughs> crazy uh, so I, you know, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I knew that like the beginning part of the song is very serious. You know, we're talking about going for your dreams, going for this thing that you want. And then at certain point, you can't take it too seriously anymore. So you have to do something different with it. And so then I was like, why don't I just try to sing this in all these different styles like a diva does? Um, so I pulled from Celine Dion, Alanis Morissette. I do do a little Liza, but not in this section. Um, maybe a little Beyonce, but you know what, Mariah Carey. But a lot of people heard other uh, performers. They were like, oh, did you do that? And I was like, uh, oh, I didn't think of, actually Mariah Carey was something that I think a review said. I go, oh, I guess that was like Mariah Carey, but I didn't think that at the time when I was doing these little high notes. I just thought of it musically and then someone connected it to, you know, um, her uh it didn't really change but it just morphed and I did longer or stretched them out and made them maybe a little bit more clear depending on what the audience responded to I can't I really don't know how it happened I just started again in rehearsal where you're in a safe fun environment to kind of throw things on the wall and if people laugh in rehearsal and the director loved it and thank you again Josh Rhodes um it stays Hmm. And it, I mean, the singing too, they're big. This is a big sing. Um, yes. is, is it difficult to kind of keep your technique in place and be conscious of that while doing, while playing around with an impression? Yeah, it takes a lot of work. And Joan Later has been my voice teacher for a long time. Her and I worked on every single thing that I do technique wise. Um, and I continue to study with her even now. Uh, I'm you know, she really cemented uh, a technique to be able to do this show eight shows a week. And and that is one thing too, but musically I added things that wasn't in the original. And, you know, uh, our musical director, John Bell was supportive of that where I sang higher. I mean, I added the thing from Wicked, I added all this stuff. So I said to Joan, I was like, can I do this eight shows a week? And she goes, yes, but we're gonna have to, let's see, let's see. And so, I was able to do it. And now I'm, you know, I'm about to do a show at Joe's pub. So I'm back. I will see, be seeing her on Thursday uh, because I have to, <laughs> I have to do a big sing on June 5th. Um, Cause the lady of the lake is coming out of the lake and out of, uh, out of retirement. She's doing her, what well, she's doing her farewell tour. So <laughs> uh, we got to, we got to pull it out for that. 
I just read that this morning. What what was the impetus behind the farewell tour? What can we expect from that? Um, well, you know, I think she was not thrilled that the show closed and she had a return to her watery depths uh, of Central Park Lake. And then she heard about award season and she was like, well, I want to stake my claim and come back one more time. And um, alongside these other divas, and uh, yeah, so she made a very big decision to do that. Um, and I think it'll be fun for people to see her again because, and two different versions of her. I'm gonna do the redhead diva and then also the Camelot version of her. So they'll get a little bit of both. Um, and it's just fun because, you know, our show closed, uh, you know, the landscape of Broadway is very tough. Our show closed too soon, even though it was a hit um, critically. Uh, but yeah, she just, she wants, she wants one more shot. So she's going to get it June 5th. <laughs> we can't wait. Um, I have to bring something back uh, to, to go back in time with you a little bit, because I think the first time I ever encountered you was like an OG viral YouTube video that you have yes. of your SNL audition, yep. where you do Liza Minnelli, you tackle the election, all these crazy characters. Um and I mean, every theater kid ever at that period was like, "Isn't that crazy?" Myself included was watching wow. it on repeat. Um, so what? When did you know that that kind of type of performance of these impressions and voices? You, and when did you say, "Like, this is my wheelhouse. This is what I can really lean into." Um, it's kind of crazy that it was like about eighteen years ago now that I did that. Oh, video. Wow. It was two thousand and eight. Isn't that nuts? Um, you know, my big dream for a long time was to be on Saturday Night Live. That was a big dream. Uh, I would hang out with uh, all the people that are now in LA and have become really big at Upright Citizens Brigade. After doing shows at Hairspray, I'd go downtown and hang out with those people. And that was really my dream for a long time, but I was a legit musical theater person. So I had to choose. That kind of comedy I've always responded to. I mean, the holy grail of, you know, of uh, Christopher Guest and Waiting for Guffman. I mean, that's sort of what I modeled that video after, um, that honest sort of comedy. And yeah, I just I just love it. Um, and so that's what I made it. I didn't, I didn't go further. They had requested that tape. I didn't go further and I was really sad for a long time, but you know, you wind up exactly where you're supposed to be. And you know, now since I work with Rachel Dratch and Taryn Killam and, They've all, you know, I've sort of been able to fulfill it in my own way and now still creating things, which is what I want to do now moving forward is creating more comedy content and uh, shows and that sort of stuff um, to keep it going because I, I miss it. I miss it. And I'm so glad it really makes me feel happy that uh, that you that it affected you and that people, young people at the time, like loved it. That makes me like so it makes me want to make more. So thank you for that. It was a very quoted video during that period. I know. Yeah. Very quoted. Thanks. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, you have continued to do those types of characters, though. I mean, you were you got to play Carol Burnett on the final season sure. of Marvelous yes. Mrs. Maisel. And not just Carol Burnett, but Once Upon a Mattress, uh, Carol yes. Burnett. Yes, yes. What was that like? Oh, you? my God. That was... That was a dream come true. I mean, you know, it happened so quickly and so une unexpectedly. I always say I have a picture of Carol Burnett in my dressing room when I do shows. I have like this beautiful little quote. Uh, and, you know, things fall into your lap in this business. You just never know. You get a phone call. Hey, um, they want you to audition to play Carol Burnett on the like last episode of the final season. And I'm like, what? And yeah, you have to audition. I'm like, sign me up. Okay, no problem. What do you need? Um, and then to be able to do that number and, you know, Amy Sherman Palladino expanded it into like a, a real number. It wasn't even supposed to be that long, but when she saw my audition, she's like, we need to do it long. We need to do a more big feature. Um, so yeah, I mean, to play Carol and to have probably a million or so people, maybe more oh, oh, and forever be able to see it whenever they watch that season. It was like so special. Carol saw it. Apparently she loved it. I didn't get to talk to her personally, but you know, it it's like a bucket list thing. You know, if I never get to play her in the biopic, uh, I've gotten to do her at a pretty high level. 
So I will, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Had Although you ever? I'd love, to, I'd love to play her in the biopic. I don't want to oh, say yeah. I wouldn't. I mean, well, I would. Put that out into the universe. Put it out sure. there in the universe. That's what <laughs> Um, well, thinking about, you know, Lady of the Lake, which uh, it's like a character that really, I think, encompasses a lot uh, of these, your history as a performer, and just feels like very quintessentially you. Um, with that in mind, like now that you can look back on it, like what is what have you taken away from it the most? What are you going to carry with you the most from that you, experience? Playing, playing her, playing mm -hmm. Lady of the Lake. You know, it's so funny. Uh, I don't think I've ever played a character where I've ever, I've actually embodied um, a sense of really like looking my best and feeling my best and uh, not, it's, yes, there's a diva quality to it, but it's a confidence. It's a confidence. It's how I'm like, oh yeah, I can carry a show. And I, I, I am pretty fierce. And I can be that side of Leslie. I can take the, the healthiest part and be that side of Leslie and carry that into my next in my next work. I think being especially like being a woman in this business, you kind of have to hold your head high and and have an incredible amount of confidence. And I think that's that's what it gave me. And also permission to like go, oh, I really can do comedy in front of these people, 1700 people every single night. And I'm as good as I've ever been. So uh, I think the next step is just continuing that growing. And she, she gave me that, she gave me that, that sort of confidence. So I'm, I'm grateful. Well, we can't wait to see after the farewell tour, of course, it just, after the we can't farewell wait to tour. see what happens. And listen, next. you never know. She, the farewell tour is selling out and pretty quickly. So she might get a, you know, farewell tour part two. If, if Joe's pub is like, well, we're selling. So she will, she will stay out as long as the people want her until she has to return to her watery condo at the bottom <laughs> of Central Park Lake, which she enjoys. She likes her condo, but. Well, Manhattan real estate, how can you not? Honey, she bought a long time ago, so she's in her real estate. <laughs> she, she has staked her claim. She has a very nice situation. Well, Leslie, congratulations again uh, on Thank your Tony you. nomination. Very well deserved. And Thanks everyone so who's watching make sure you stick with gold derby the rest of the season leslie thank you so much it's been great thank you thanks for having me